Good evening. Good evening. Today we're in our third and final class in chapter one in part two of our textbook, The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. As a reminder, this chapter is titled The Flesh and Salvation. Before we begin, as usual, we'll open with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we have to learn of your word, Heavenly Father, to learn these deep truths of your word as you reveal to Watchman E, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for revealing to us this doctrine of the trichotomy of mankind, that we are body, soul, and spirit, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for providing to this man and to us today, God, this wonderful understanding, Lord, that we can deepen our relationship with you and deepen our understanding of how salvation works, Heavenly Father, and how our new life in Christ is, Heavenly Father, this new spiritual life that you desire for all of us, Heavenly Father. Pray, Lord God, that we would take what we learned tonight, Lord, in every class, Lord, that we have here, God. I pray that we would take what we learned, Lord, and register in our spirits, Heavenly Father, and it would truly transform our lives, God. I pray for an anointing on our ears, Lord, that we would hear what is to be said tonight. I pray for you would anoint our hearts, Heavenly Father, that, they would be, that we would will to receive through them, God, what you have for us here in this lesson, God. I pray you anoint my tongue to speak this lesson, Lord. May it all be you and you alone, Heavenly, Th Heavenly Father. Nothing from my soul, nothing from my mind, Heavenly Father, but solely, he Heavenly Father. May this be from your spirit, Heavenly Father, through my spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As a reminder, the purpose of this course is to study in depth the trichotomy of mankind, which refers to how all people are comprised of three parts. Does anyone know by now? Yeah, it's very easy to remember. It's the title of our class, Spirit, Soul, and Body. So our memory verse in this class is Romans chapter 7, verses 24 to 25. Now, does anyone remember that? <laughs> Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Yes, this, when it says here, I serve the law of God with my mind, it means the mind that has been renewed by the Holy Spirit. It's not just our mind and the soul alone, but it is the renewed mind through the Holy Spirit. And the flesh, the self of the flesh that serves the law of sin. While the trichotomy of mankind, it is important to stress that while this doctrine is not a cardinal one, it isn't one that's going to determine whether or not you go to heaven. It is, however, one that is, an Im is immensely important to receiving the abundant life of Christ. Believers who understand and apply these doctrines truths are far more likely to receive the fullness of Christ's abundant life, to live the spiritual life, to grow spiritually. Furthermore, this doctrine is very important because it gives us a deeper understanding of other doctrines. For example, it helps us understand better how salvation works, why we need a Savior, and what He's done, what His salvation does to us. How we learn that before salvation, our spirit is dead because it is dead to God through sin, and that cut off our communication with God. And it is the soul that is taken over, and it is the spirit that can regain control once again through the Holy Spirit, bringing it back to, back to life, that Jesus has defeated our sin, and the sin of our flesh is defeated and that our soul, spirit can assume control, and the, it, it, the Holy Spirit, through our spirit, can renew the soul, and that through our bodies and through our souls, that, we can, that God can outpour his love and his truth through, through, through us. The immense importance of this study is noted by Watson and Nee in the beginning of chapter 2 and part 4 of our book. Here, he notes that our spirit can be, oppo and can be oppressed by our body and soul, that it can be oppressed by the body and soul. What does that mean? It means that the flesh, that when we live in the flesh, we suppress the work of God through our spirit. God can only transform us through the spirit. He cannot transform our flesh. So in that sense, we hinder God's work when we live in the flesh. And what this does, the only reward <clears throat> living in the flesh does is that it causes us to live a miserable and frustrating life in the flesh that severely stifles our spiritual growth. It, it robs us of the opportunities and blessings that God has for us. It robs us of the spiritual growth that he desires for us. It makes us spiritual babies, basically. It leaves us as spiritual babies. 
Such a life is controlled by our lower parts, which on their own refuse to surrender to God. This is why we cannot live in the flesh. But paralleling how a sinner can choose to remain unsaved or become a believer, we can remain carnal Christians and live this weak, defeated life deprived of God's love, joy, and peace. Or we can develop into truly spiritual believers that experience and exhibit the fullness of Christ's life in us. Faith in Christ transforms us into regenerated believers. That's the bare minimum of salvation is accepting Christ. But that is the only the beginning for obedience to the Holy Spirit, making that right relationship with the Holy Spirit and continually obeying Him on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is what makes us spiritual and sanctified believers. The latter is the goal of this study, to reveal the importance of this and to reveal how we can build the right and obedient relationship with the Spirit so that we can die to our carnal lusts in our bodies, so that we can allow our souls to become increasingly submitted to our spirits and enable the fullness of God's nature and power to flow in and through us. That is the goal of this study. It is the meat, and potato, it is the meat of the word, as you will. During our previous class, we continued our studies on the flesh, noting how its existence necessitated God's plan of salvation for mankind. We first discussed the unregenerated life, noting how it is entirely, entirely lived in the flesh, where man either lives lawlessly in sin or religiously strives in vain to keep at least some of God's commands. However, we found that because the flesh is completely resistant to God's will, and cannot keep the entirety of God's law, for breaking one law breaks them all. God, and therefore all people, do not have the power to fix the old sin nature, which is the flesh and the unregenerated life within it. If God cannot fix this, we most certainly cannot. Next, we discuss Christ's salvation, noting how man's hopeless state in the flesh led God to selflessly and mercifully take our salvation completely upon himself. We explored the incarnation here, noting how Christ came in the likeness of flesh, thereby making himself, through this and living in perfect life, available to take our place and put to death our sin on the cross. Finally, we examine the regenerated life in Christ, noting how a person, or how a person receiving Christ's salvation experiences a new spiritual life, a spiritual birth through the Holy Spirit, which brings the believer's dead spirit back to life. We noted how this regeneration cannot come through the works of the flesh, but solely through Christ's redeeming work on the cross. As our studies on these topics reveal, man in the flesh is completely hopeless, unable to change, and completely incapable of saving himself from God's judgment. Such is why the only hope for humanity is to enter into new birth via Christ's salvation and grow in disassociation from the old life and the flesh that we once lived in. So tonight, we will be finishing this chapter on the flesh, the first chapter in part two. Before we begin, I would like you all to picture in your mind for a moment two opposing kingdoms. On one side is an army fighting in the name of a righteous king while the other is an army waging war for an evil kingdom. Both sides are completely opposed to one another with no hope of any sort of peace. Rather, these two sides are constantly walked, or locked into bitter war for a crucial territory. Such describes the war all believers are engaged in at the moment of regeneration. Nee spends the remainder of our current chapter detailing this bitter conflict that is unendingly waged between the new life in Christ in the old life of our flesh. Then the territory in that, in that example I had is our lives, basically. It is our lives. It is our minds. It is our soul. Whether or not we are willing to submit to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. As we will see, we have the ability and responsibility to decide which side to surrender to in every circumstance, decision, and temptation. This is not a one-time thing. This is every moment. This is a war that is waged every moment, and every moment is a decision that we must make which kingdom we will, we will surrender to. So tonight's class will be on the conflict between the old and new. It is essential for a regenerated person, a believer in Christ, to understand what he has obtained through new birth and what still lingers in his natural endowment. 
Such knowledge will help him as he continues his spiritual journey. To understand this, we must study the contents of man's flesh and how the Lord Jesus, in his redemption, deals with the flesh's constituents. Here, we are concerned with what a believer inherits from the old life upon regeneration. So reading Romans chapter 7 makes clear that there are two components of the flesh, the sin and me, or the self. Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 18 state, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer what I do, that I who do it, but sin who dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. The sin here is the power of sin, and the me here is what we commonly acknowledge as self or the self-life. If a believer desires to understand spiritual life, he must not be confused about these two elements of the flesh. As we studied in one of our previous classes, we know the Lord Jesus has dealt with the sin of our flesh on his cross. And the word informs us that our old self was crucified with him. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to be crucified, since this has been done and done perfectly by Christ already. With, reg with regard to this question of sin, man is not required to do anything. He only needs to consider this an accomplished fact. What he does, when he does this, he will reap the effectiveness of the death of Jesus in being wholly de in wholly delivered from the power of sin. Romans chapter 10, verses 6, or 10 to 11 say, For the death he died, he died in si to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Also, Romans chapter 6, verse 14 says, For sin we, we have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. We are never asked in the Bible to be crucified for sin. In other words, the Bible does not ask us to crucify, to physically crucify our bodies. However, Scripture does exhort us to take up the cross for denying self. The Lord Jesus instructs us many times to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. This explanation for, the explanation for this is that the Lord Jesus deals with our sins and with ourselves very differently. There's a difference in dealing with the sin and the self. To wholly conquer sin, the believer needs but a moment. It is just receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But to deny the self requires a lifetime. Only on the cross did Jesus bear our sin. Yet throughout his life, the Lord denied himself. He denied his self-life. The same must be true for us. The Galatian letter of Paul delineates the relationship between the flesh and the believer. He tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, that on the one hand, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. On the very day one becomes identified with the Lord Jesus, his flesh is also crucified. With this verse, it becomes easily, easy to rationalize without the Holy Spirit's instruction that the flesh is no longer present within us. After all, has it not been, been crucified as Paul says? But no, on the other hand, the letter says to walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. In verse 5, verses 16 to 17 in Galatians. This reminds me of our previous study on systematic theology. It's important to not just take one verse out of Scripture. That's proof texting. We don't proof text in any of our studies in the Bible. We always to interpret Scripture through Scripture. Here we are told openly that one who belongs to Christ Jesus and is already the indwelling of the Holy Spirit still has the flesh within him. Not only does this flesh exist, it is described as being singular, singularly powerful as well. What can we say? Are the teachings of these two verses contradictory? No, not at all. 
Verse 24 stresses the sin of the flesh. Well, verse 17 refers to the, se the self of the flesh. The cross of Christ deals with sin, and the Holy Spirit through the cross deals with self. Christ has dealt with our sin on the cross, but the Holy Spirit must constantly deal with our self through the cross, through the work of the cross of Christ. Christ delivers the believer completely from the power of sin through the cross, that sin may no longer reign. But by the Holy Spirit, who dwells within the believer, Christ enables him to overcome self daily and obey him perfectly. Liberation from sin is an accomplished fact, but denial of self is to be a daily experience. If a believer could understand the full implication of the cross at the time that he is born anew, he would be freed wholly from sin on the one side and on the other be in possession of a new life. It is indeed regrettable that many believers fail to present this full salvation to sinners so that the latter believer just so that the latter believe just half of God's salvation. This leaves them as if they are only half saved. Their sins are forgiven and they will go to heaven, but they lack the strength to cease from sin. Moreover, even on the occasions when salvation is presented completely, sinners desire just to have their sins forgiven, for they do not sincerely expect deliverance from the power of sin. This equally renders them half saved, per se. When a person believes and receives full salvation at the very outset, he will experience less failure battling with sin and more success battling with self. Rarely are such believers found. Most enter upon only half their salvation. Their conflicts are therefore mainly with sin, and some do not even know what self is. In, their, in this connection, the personal condition of the believer pays, plays a part before regeneration. Many tend to do good even before they believe. They, of course, do not possess the power to do good, nor could they be good. But their conscience seems to be comparatively enlightened, though their strength to do good is nevertheless weak. They experience what is commonly called the conflict between reason and lust. Now, when these hear of God's total salvation, they eagerly accept grace for release from sin, even as they receive grace for total forgiveness of sin. Others, however, be before believing, before believing, have pitch black consciousness, consciousness, sin terribly, and never intend to do good. Upon hearing of God's whole salvation, they naturally grasp the grace of forgiveness, but neglect, not reject, the grace for deliverance of sin, or from sin. They will encounter much struggle over sin of the flesh afterwards. Why is the latter case so? Because such a reborn man possesses a new life which demands him to overcome the rule of his flesh and to obey the new life instead. God's life is absolute. It must gain complete mastery over the man. As soon as that life enters the human spirit, it requires the man to leave his former master of sin and to be subject entirely to the Holy Spirit. It says, one man said, if Christ is not king over all, he is not king at all. He is king over nothing in our lives if he's not king over everything. Even so, sin in this particular man is deeply rooted. Although his will is being renewed in part through the regenerated life, it is still tied to sin and self. On many occasions, it bends towards sin. Inevitably, great conflict will erupt between the new life and the flesh. Since people in this condition are numerous, we shall pay special attention to them. It is important to stress here however, that this experience of prolonged struggle and failure with sin, different from that of self, is unnecessary. Picture, picture in your mind two completely different kings within the same kingdom. Because both hold to completely different goals, ruling styles, and agendas, the two are always in conflict for power over the kingdom, though only one can rule at a time. However, each one's reign lasts only as long as the people under him willingly surrender to his reign. Such a picture represents the struggle between Christ and our flesh in our lives. The flesh demands full sovereignty, and so does the spiritual life in Christ. The flesh desires to have man forever attached to itself, while the spiritual life wants to have man completely subject to the Holy Spirit. At all points, the flesh and spiritual life differ. The nature of the former is that of the first Adam. The nature of the latter belongs to the last Adam, Christ. The motive of the first is earthly, that of the second, heavenly. 
The flesh focuses all things upon self. Spiritual life centers all things upon Christ. The flesh wishes to lead man to sin, but spiritual life longs to lead him to righteousness. Such, or since these two are so essentially contrary, how can a person avoid clashing continually with the flesh? Not realizing the full salvation of Christ, a believer constantly experiences such a struggle. When young believers fall into such conflict, they are, un, they are dumbfounded. Some despair of spiritual growth, thinking they are just too bad. Others begin to doubt they are regen, genuinely regenerated, not aware that regeneration itself is what brings this contention. Formerly, when the flesh was in authority without interference, for the spirit was dead, they could sin terribly without feeling any sense of sinfulness, of guilt. As this new light penetrates the man, it immediately exposes the defilement and corruption within. The new desire is naturally dissatisfied to remain in such a state and longs to follow the will of God. The flesh begins to contend with the spiritual life. Such battle gives the believer an impression that house within him are two persons. Each has its, has its own idea and strength. Each seeks victory. When the spiritual life is in ascendancy, the believer is most glad. But when the flesh gains the upper hand, he cannot help but grieve. Experience of this type is what confirms that such people are believers, that they have been regenerated and are saved and are going to go to heaven. As we learned in our previous class, God never intends to reform the flesh, but to destroy it. It is by God's life given the believer at regeneration that the self in the flesh is to be destroyed. The life God imparts to man is indeed most powerful, but the regenerated person is still a babe, newly born and very weak. The flesh long has held the reins and its power is tremendous. Tremendous. Furthermore, the regenerated one has, has not yet learned to apprehend by faith God's complete salvation. Though he be saved, he is still the flesh during this period. Being fleshly denotes being governed by the flesh. What is most pitiful is for a believer to find himself too weak to overcome the flesh. Although he is enlightened by God's word to know the wickedness of the flesh and to desire with full heart victory over it through the Spirit, this is the moment when he sheds many tears of sorrow. How can he not be angry with himself? For, there, for though he harbors a new desire to destroy sin and to please God, his will is not steadfast enough to subdue the body of sin. Few are the victories, many the defeats. It is encouraging to know that this struggle is not exclusive to believers today, but it was intensely felt by men as godly and spirit-filled as the apostles. Even Apostle Paul himself, and who was, even Paul himself was incredibly vocal in expressing the inner anguish of this conflict. He does so in Romans chapter 7. We can see in verses 15 to 23, he says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do it is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my innermost part, in my inmost self, the spirit. But I see in my members, the flesh, another law at war within, another law at war with the law in my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin which dwells in my members. Many will deeply relate to this cry of the Apostle Paul, and relate especially to verse 24 in his nearly final despair. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? from this body of death. What is the meaning of this contention? Why does God allow us? Why does God allow the struggle between the flesh and the spirit? It is because it is a crucial and necessary part of spiritual growth. And, it, and the reason for this is because it is one of the ways the Holy Spirit disciplines us. God has provided a whole salvation for man. The believer who does not know, know he has it will not be able to enjoy it. Neither will he be able to experience it if he does not desire after it. 
God can only give to those who believe, receive, and claim. When, when man hence asks for forgiveness and regeneration, God surely bestows it upon him. And it is, though, it is through conflict that God induces the believer to seek and to grasp total triumph in Christ. If it was not for this conflict, we probably wouldn't even desire the spiritual life to begin with. It is this guilt that it builds within us, that, it re- that we realize something is wrong, that we're not living the way God wants us. We're not living this life that we could live. That is why he allows this conflict in us. It is a wake-up call for us, and it's over and over and over again that draws us closer. It is these struggles that draw us closer to God, that make us realize that we need him, that we cannot live the spiritual life unless we surrender to him, unless we truly come to realize just how depraved and how weak and how totally worthless to God we are in ourselves. It is only through Christ that we can truly serve God. That is what this conflict is for. So it is through this conflict that God induces the believer to seek and to grasp total triumph in Christ. He who was ignorant before, before will now seek to know. The Holy Spirit will then be afforded a chance to reveal to him how Christ had dealt with his old man on the cross so that, he, so that the believer will now know and to believe into possessing such triumph. And he, who does, he, and he who does not possess because he did not seek will discover through his battle that all the truth he had was merely intellectual and consequentially ineffectual. This will stir him to desire to experience, to experience the truth only he, will, he only mentally had known. This strife increases as the days go by. If believers will proceed faithfully without giving into despair, they will incur fiercer conflict until they are delivered. In this class, we continue to study the flesh, specifically in light with how salvation affects it and the war it unendingly wages with the spiritual life. We first discuss the two elements of the flesh, the sin and the self. While Christ's crucifixion put to death the flesh's sin, itself, itself still remains within us. We then discuss the importance of overcoming the self of the flesh. Specifically, while Christ's salvation completely defeats the sin of the flesh immediately, itself can only be overcome through daily denying self through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not something we can do on our own. We must have the right relationship with the Holy Spirit to overcome the flesh. Finally, we discuss the ensuing battle between the self of our flesh and the spiritual life we receive upon salvation. Though the struggle can make believers question their salvation, it is this struggle that is the very thing that proves our regeneration. For that guilt, for the guilt that comes from sin and the desire to overcome self only come to those who have Christ's new life and through it can be convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit. It is this conflict that God allows for this purpose to make us realize that there is a war within us and that we need to pursue this spiritual life. Armed with this knowledge, as the Apostle Paul was when writing Romans chapter 7, we can, as like him, come to Christ, acknowledging our inability to overcome the self of the flesh and ask for his Holy Spirit to give us the strength endurance and, daily, and desire to daily, moment by moment, deny self and grow in the spiritual life that Christ has grace, gracious, gracefully won for us on Calvary. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message tonight. Lord, I pray you keep what we learned tonight in our hearts. I pray you bless this last song of worship in Jesus' name. Amen.